Um, so um, let me let me just do a little introduction here briefly, Jennifer, and then we will get uh, to learn and know more about you as well, because I'm sure our audience wants to learn about you. Um, so this is Siraj Barwani, uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Acuity Ads, uh, the publicly owned company, Canadian company, uh, that invented Illumin, uh, the first omni-channel journey automation platform in the ad tech industry. So uh, with me here today is Jennifer, head of uh, you know marketing. And uh, my goodness, you know, frankly, Jennifer, you're the one I'm going to ask to introduce yourself and talk about both your company and your background. It would be fabulous to hear. Now, I must tell the audience. So Jennifer and I go back, God knows, in the late 90s. Uh, and frankly, between you and I, there is the entire history of digital advertising. That's a good <laughs> idea, right? <clears throat> so Jennifer, to you, go ahead. Give, give us a little background. What is Mass Mutual and, uh, and uh, what's your role there? Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me here today. Um, so Mass Mutual is uh, a financial services company based in uh, Boston, in Massachusetts, uh, Springfield, and New York, and a number of other offices. Um, we uh, are a uh, financial services whole life, mainly protection products company, and um, very, very excited to talk about what, what we're doing with that today in a marketing sense. Uh, my role as a CMO is um, to run all of advertising media, creative, um, an internal ad agency, external partners. Um, I also focus on the customer research uh, insights and um, all of the marketing functions for distribution and product. And I have the great pleasure of running our community um, responsibility and foundation programs as well. Excellent, my goodness, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a lot. That's, uh, <laughs> you are covering an amazing spectrum of activities there. Um, so Jennifer, it would be an understatement to say how much has actually happened over the past two years, right? I mean, you compare that with the years before that in marketing, um, what kind of changes have you noticed in fundamentally marketing is about audience and it's about dealing with consumers and customers. And so with the behaviors that you have noticed and so forth evolve over especially the last 18 months, two years, what have you noticed? What changes have you noticed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just been really crazy. I don't think anybody would undermine and say that the last two years, um, certainly coming out of a pandemic, haven't seen massive shifts um, in what our consumers are doing and how to engage with them. Um, I think specifically what we've really been looking at is um, a, a couple of things. Some are shifts in the demographics of the population, and then some are shifts are in truly consumer behavior, because both of them have really impacted the way that we market and how we present ourselves um, in the industry. Um, I think from a shift in population and demographics, um, we have seen a lot of long-term demographic trends that we think are gonna continue to keep shifting, um, which have impacted consumer behavior, specifically as it relates to financial services and, and the need for the protection products we offer. Um, and the first of that is, in our, is really right now around demographics. The current population is the oldest in US history and it's still aging. Those that put, make up over 40 years of age and older are at about 47% of the population today compared to around 23% in 1990. Um, secondly is a, a massive shifts around marital status. The rate of Americans who have considered themselves never married are at an all time high. We're on 33% of the adult population right now, never getting married. Mm -hmm. um, and the third is around race and ethnicity. Um, the current population is the most diverse in US history where we have over 40% of the population um, in, this, in this bracket, in this demographic age. And, and they're also a lot younger. So their cumulative lifetime spending projection is expected to be a lot greater than most average households. So that's just sort of like the profile of like the type of customers and, and the behavior and who we're looking at from a solutions perspective. Um, I think we've also seen um, huge cultural and behavior shifts around digital expectations. And for sure, a lot of this comes from living in a socially distanced, accelerated world um, has really increased the need for digital solutions and those expectations that consumers will um, retain those high digital expectations once we come out of the pandemic. Um, and last, I think what's really important to us as an industry too is trust. Um, but I think that's really critical for all brands. Um, as social cohesion and institutional trust have really eroded over the last couple of years, consumer interest in brand activism 
and um, policy positioning has really spiked. And we've seen huge amount of the impact that consumer trust can have on tangible business and regulatory impacts. Yeah, well, those are those are big, big trends that you're talking about at this point. And I think if you were to look forward, and I'm going to go in like two steps here, I'm looking at sort of looking at retrospectively so that we understand where you've been. Then we will go to sort of where you see the next year looking like or the next 18 months, right? But the trends you talked about are actually here to stay for a while. I mean, we're talking about the next decade or two, or maybe more in terms of, so there is some degree of like, you can count on those trends to really be there and you can plan around it, which is nice, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at your, your own organization and your own marketing evolution that has happened in those last couple of years, three years, how have you changed? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been interesting for sure. I think these, um, the age and demographic shifts have really made us rethink the way that we look at our customer journeys and the way that we market to these customers to reach them at key purchasing points. Traditionally, I think within financial services companies for sure, and especially those of us in protection and life products, we used to follow what we saw were common life stages uh -huh. to trigger a purchase opportunity. So this is right. where the marketing messaging and the moment really focused on. And these would include things such as marriage, getting a first job, having children and such like that. And with these population shifts, we've certainly started to see that that has to move away from that. We have to move away from traditional events that, that we used to see people following and into things that we now call our sort of wake up call. Um, a wake up call is certainly something that all of us have been through in the last uh, two years for sure. Um, but wake up calls are when a neighbor or a relative or someone close to us has an event that was unexpected. And then it raises this recognition that we should be better protected or we should be better saving for financial needs or insurance needs. And so that's, you know, that's really one of the things that we've started to really focus on and think differently about. Um, and certainly the growing digital mindset. You know, our customers and their digital expectations made us shift our marketing approach too. Um, this, I don't think this necessarily means that they tend to be, you know, we're only focusing on millennials because I don't think that's the only group that has this mindset right now. It doesn't mean that we have to look at our customers with being younger or having a different profile of needs because our core product offering hasn't changed much in a hundred years. But what has changed is the purchasing patterns and behaviors on how our customers wanna work with us. And that's where we also have to shift the role of marketing as well. Um, we use a digital always on approach right now. And where in the past, before I started at Mass Mutual, you know, traditionally you would run campaigns that were social and they were eight weeks in market and then you'd shut it down and shift into something different. You know, we really have to use digital at scale um, and the opportunity for us to use it, leverage the key tools that we use as a brand and then give them to the distribution um, and our advisors and our sales force it helps them to scale and they've become much more digitally engaged in social and digital marketing tools as well. Excellent, okay. So that's sort of what we are looking at the rear view mirror, right? Let's look forward now, okay? So I'm gonna ask you in four stages here because it's sort of the evolution of the way the marketing has played out, right? So let's start with media, mm -hmm. the role of media. You already started going there. So the role of media, how is that going to evolve for you when you look at the coming year, coming 18 months, essentially, right? So the channels you've been using are where the shifts might be or where the major allocations might be. How are you going to look at, look at that in, in yeah. and see that? Yeah, no surprises here. I say I would say most of the consumers are much more attached to their screens than ever before living through a pandemic. Um, this stay at home mandates really boosted the consumption of all types of media in, in, in multiple places. Um, you know, I, I think reading, I remember reading by mid September, maybe mid September or the summer of 2020, um, consumers were spending an average of 53 hours a week on media, which was the oh, fastest yeah. annual growth rate in five years. <laughs> it's crazy. And we all thought it was just our kids that was doing it, but everybody is now. Um, and I think the digital will maintain this as the big winner, which we clearly saw in 2020 and 21 between social, audio, video, and streaming. Um, there's no doubt, I think, that streaming media as a group was one of the biggest boomers and winners out of the pandemic. Sure. And we're watching that. And we see that there's going to be a lot more growth here, especially with video in 2022. So these will be um, key tools for us to build as we build our plans in 22. 
Um, we're also spending time evaluating the growth in OTT and on demand, which I think will be really big movers next year. Um, it's certainly related to subscription growth, um, but a lot around video on demand as well. Um, SVO, SVOD, TVOD, AVOD, we're, we're looking at all of these opportunities for yeah, video. I think um, so. You know, you know, Jennifer, on that topic that you just mentioned, right? There are all these four-letter words all over the place, right? <laughs> the thing, the thing here is when you look at subscription versus ad-supported video on demand, right. right? For the brand that you represent, I can see that AVOD would be of extreme relevance because you're obviously embedding your messaging there and your advertising and so forth. What was the role that you would play in subscription video? Will there be any uh, I don't, opportunity there? Yeah, I don't think we've, we've started to really dive into some of the components of that from a strategy perspective. And it might be working in some of our distribution partners opportunities. I, see. Okay. I think some of it, um, maybe more on TVOD is what we're looking at. Um, that works really well for live events and linear okay. live streams. I you know, there's still people out there. We have these large groups of a distribution sales force that we traditionally used to get together for training or recognition you know, type of events. Um, where we'd go and spend five or six days together and just a ton of content to bring them up to speed on the business and what's happening. And we can't now, people still aren't really completely there yet. So I think some of those opportunities are really extending into different places for us, but um, a lot to think about for sure, um, figuring out how we can you know, change this. I think the biggest thing is we're, we're in this radical reconsideration where more of us are really opening to changing our long standing habits. Um, and that includes brand loyalty and buying. And, and I think that's what's going to come out of the last 20 months. And that's what we really have to think about as we plan for media in 2022. It's not going to be the same things we used to always rely on. Got it. So now I was going to go down the lane of asking you questions about branding versus performance, media, yeah. right? But before I go there, because you've gone down this discussion of brand loyalty and how do you really create the connection the absolute first question comes up is what is the content what are you focused on in terms of the way you tell the story of what mass mutual is you notice i just asked you this question i'm sure plenty of mass mutual products are relevant to me by the way <laughs> but but the fact of the matter is i may not have really paid attention to that and so the question is what, first of all, are you doing to get that attention going, right? Before I go into the media side of it, let's talk about your message. Where are you evolving your message as a result of these changes in consumer behavior? I think it really has to be, well, we rely a lot on data-driven and we do a lot on uh, content strategy. We use a lot of partners and a lot of content tools. And I think what you really have to figure out if you're looking at it from a brand perspective, it really has to be around what's culturally relevant to people. We've run numbers of campaigns over the past five years that were really honing in on what was the most important and appropriate message in market today around cultural trends. When we're talking about products, I think it's really similar and we are in a, in a, bit of a unique, although maybe to some of quite unfortunate situation, where over the last two years, if you look at the life insurance and limer results, life insurance sales are on a spike right now because of this recognition and what's happened with the pandemic. So when there's an opportunity for us to see that it's important to consumers in the market to talk about the products, that's where we really lean in to some of that messing. But we really have to, we have a, a really cross-functional, big cross-functional team that looks at both the distribution channel needs, our product needs and our customer and brand needs and make sure that we are really tracking on data to put the appropriate message in the appropriate market. Got it. So on that topic, now it makes more sense now to really focus on, you know, this distinction that we have seen between, okay, how much real branding focused right. investment should be done versus how much performance, right? Given that it seems like most of your distribution is through the agent and the advisor channel, correct? Mm-hmm. So given that, how does that influence your choices in terms of, okay, should I be spending more money on branding and getting my message out there and building more awareness? Should I be doing more sort of performance and really getting the advisors and tools in their hands? How do you make those choices in your business? Well, it's, I think it's a challenge that every one of us has, no matter where we are, um, in which industry we're in specifically. And I think for us, we're in a little bit of a, uh, it's a little bit more of a complicated model because um, unlike some of our competitors, 
a lot of our advisors don't necessarily carry our brand. They could be, um, you know, personally branded or they work with other groups. So um, where does the role of the brand play for them? And that obviously means how do we dictate and spend? I think the most um, consistent thing with our brand strategy when we are speaking about it is that we carry across multiple business units and we serve as not just a distributor, but also a manufacturer. So we distribute a lot of mass mutual manufactured products on third party platforms with partners. We also have a large institutional business and we have a top 10 broker dealer. So we do a lot of wealth management as well. So when you think about what is the role of brand, it's not specifically in which channel does it support, but what are we supporting as an enterprise? And I think that's where the brand is important for us to generate that awareness so that whenever you get to the point of sale, whatever the distributor is or whatever that sale is, that people have that concept and that good relationship and that good feeling with the brand. And I think that's where we've always gone to making sure that people understand the strategy for the brand is different in that context, um, that it has to really drive at the, at the point of sale for us. Um, and that's, you know, that's not always as easy as it sounds, but it also plays a role of being really tactical and being in performance driven marketing as well. So when we first um, you know, when I started here five years ago, the strategy was how do we relaunch a brand that was over 165 years old that had, um, you know, some awareness in the marketplace, but really needed to make sure that everybody understood what the strength of it was from a recognition and awareness part. What we have done over the past number of years has rose those numbers to a point where the consideration numbers are shifting really high as well. And that's what makes us start to shift into using the brand as a performance and growth role, which we've, which we've been doing a lot of over the last 12 to 24 months. So um, to get to this point, we spent the past year or so building a proprietary media model system where you can, um, working with our data science teams and our technology teams, really understanding how to get real-time attribution and optimization against the media. Um, it's amazing to see the range of options that we can get into using our different distribution channels um, and certainly with the innovations of video and podcast and streaming and audio and others. Um, but I think that the, the, the real essence here is when we have such a large enterprise brand, the brand isn't necessarily the product, it's the value of what we have as a company and what we believe in and the principles. Um, and then you mix that with the ability to come down the funnel um, and make sure that you're using different channels to make the performance marketing work harder, drive direct engagement, and generate real data for us. Um, so we really have the full understanding of the role that each media channel plays, and then how do we use it when we want to be talking brand messaging versus really distinct performance and growth marketing. Got it. No, I think you contextualize it really well. And I think you put it in a cycle where you have started with all the branding related efforts to drive up the awareness levels, which is very clear if I got that right. Mm -hmm. And now it makes sense, obviously, to move people down into the journey somewhere in the consideration right. set, continuing to keep the brand top of mind, of course, right? And then so that when consumers go to a particular agent or a particular distribution mm -hmm. outlet, they explicitly ask for it. Yeah. And I think that's really how you're trying to create the pull yes. into the marketing and potentially you are doing the same thing on the push side of it. Right. So that at the same sort of intersection point, something good happens, which drives, you know, profitable behaviors for you. So I get that. So the, so that's very, very helpful. Thank you for explaining it that way. So when we look at 2022 now, right, for you, does this trend continue? And the question for me here in particular is where are the specific channels where you are beginning to see more traction? Let me give you a little cue here. I mean, this is not as open-ended a question as it sounds. <laughs> um, there has been a lot of talk about contextual advertising where because we have limited access to potentially cookies, third-party data, whatever, whatever, perhaps meeting people in the moment, in context, especially given the emergence of machine learning and AI, and it's getting so sophisticated that you can literally tell what people are watching right now, what part of the video they're looking at or content they're looking at, or what part of the, the page or the, or the, or the message they're reading, are you seeing a role fitting in there somewhere as you look at sort of the, the role of media as it evolves with this level of sophistication? Does that change 
your consideration as to looking at media in a more in context way, in the moment way? How do you see yeah. that? I think it. I think it has to be there, and I think especially if you're li looking at living in this digital space, that's really what the point and purpose and people expect are. So you know, we've done a lot of work with um, you know really um, tracking through video, tracking through digital in you know in real time context um, and retargeting and moving people across different channels, and that's that's a lot of what I think the challenge is because when you're really focusing on the customer journey. It's just, it's bouncing all over the place on you at a rapid pace right now. And, and that's where what we've really looked at is making sure that we're not, um, you know, intruding or interrupting um, because we also are not ultimately, which I think is the significant value of digital, we're ultimately not sending you to purchase. It's not direct to consumer direction with what we're doing, but we're trying to make sure that you are acting on something that's valuable and relevant where we can, we sort of earn that right to interrupt whatever that experience, the video or, you know, the social or the context is. So I think it's really important to make sure that what, the way we create that is in appropriate sort of, you know, engaging and maybe not long stream for some cases, but more snap, you know, snappable, digestible, small pieces to just show up to people where we're reminding them, but not intruding. And I think that's really the challenge. Um, you know, we constantly have a lot of conversations on the shift and focus of what digital is for us in our media spend. Um, and it works really well for direct to consumer or retail type of products. For us, you know, it's really about making sure that we're adding value and staying top of mind. And the most we can do is drive you to the reference to find an advisor or learn more or engage with the learning tool or figure out something about your finances. You know, it's it's a really different way, a place to play without being, um, you know, uh, interrupting people, I think. is Understood. No, that's amazing clarification. Thank you for doing that. I now get it, right? So the, 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 the way you've made a reference to the customer journey at least two or three times already. So let me work off of that particular uh, topic. When you look at the journey from the time when you are looking at moments where it's relevant to bring the mass mutual, the brand message, right? And bringing them to consideration, thinking about it, you know, connecting them with their life and what they're doing and so forth. And you look at all the touch points going all the way to the place where you don't really have much control. They're going to go and buy whatever they're going to buy and they're going to make that decision at that point, as you pointed out, right? But if you look at that entire journey, where are the biggest friction points for you right now where you might focus more energies next year? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. I think that... Um... We, we spend a lot of time on this topic because I, again, really understanding where we fit in the role of the funnel and when we can sort of like step in or step out as we were saying. Um, and I think the friction point for us is always the same. Everybody wants a seamless personalized experience. When we move across so many channels, it's hard for brands to make them connected in a consistent way in the back end. And we know that ultimately, that's going to break. And when you create the break in the experience, you create the friction. And when they hit that block in the purchasing journey, it ruins the experience and ultimately the sale. So I think what's important for us, and it depends on what the journey is and what the pan, the sort of the, the path that we're sending them through. Um, for us, it's really not necessarily one consistent friction point, but it's really the challenge to know that when you, if you don't have it connected on the back end with the technology and the analytics to know exactly where that happened, you're really never going to get ahead of that, that issue. I mean, you know, there's no one common place that we find we break in, in the experience funnel because the reason that we have the analytics and journey orchestration plans are to optimize the journeys and then go back and fix it. Um, so I think it's it, it tends to be um, in places where we really move into um, more of the newer technologies, I think, where people find that you really can't get that connection on the back end. Um, and when you really have an experience that isn't ultimately directed at the right customer to begin with, you know, I think there's a, there's lots of great conversation around shoppable media, which we can't, we don't necessarily engage in because our primary distribution partner is the advisor, but for, for D2C companies, I think it's a powerful tool. Um, I also think shoppable, shoppable media is a great way to reduce friction because it drives you right to the purchase, but it's also in a much more a wider range of experiences to present. I think it's a brilliant creative tool because you could be posting, you know, imagery and photos 
um, you know, in Instagram and, and video things. And it just, it's in, it's in the moment and it's amazing, amazing for different purchasing behaviors. And I think that's really the key where you can understand where the friction hits. What is the behavior they're coming in? Emotional or impulsive purchases, last minute shoppers. That's something where I think shoppable moments really works well because you know you've got somebody in, in that moment and they're going to react to it. If you're trying to bring them through an education of what the product is or a bigger, longer journey, and you're going to try to get them across multiple touch points of education or customer service, then that friction point could be really different. Yes, yes. Thank you for clarifying that. That is so true. I think it's all about consideration part of it, right? Because I think you're in a category where people think a lot, right? right. It's not something they just immediately say, oh, wow, of course, I'm going to buy this life insurance in there, or my long-term <laughs> care plan or whatever, right? I mean, it's something that you just kind of mulling over for a while, you're looking at the things and so forth, and it could take, I don't know how long it takes. I mean, there are some statistics that we are lucky if we make one big financial decision in a year. Right, right. right. But that's a, that's a tough thing for you because you really have to stay there with them for a while before a decision is going to be made, right? The brand has to stay there. So what we were saying earlier, that's what the brand recognition and awareness is important for. But for the ultimate decision to be made, some advisors could spend eight months trying to um, really go through a, a comprehensive plan with somebody to figure out what the best decisions are for them. And the decisions to make an investment in these type of products comes from a lot of different places. It comes from peers, it comes from friends, it comes from educa education, it depends on what the consumer's behavior is. So as long as we can stay top of mind while they're still mulling over, or we can add value in helping them with that decision, understanding why it's the right fit for them, or at a minimum, really appreciating and understanding as a brand, they would want to be with us. You know, I, I always say that consumers brand, we buy from, from brands that we love and everything else we just shop on Amazon. If you need it tomorrow, you just go to Amazon, but if you want something <laughs> that you love, you know, whatever it is, if it's your favorite clothing or it's a favorite, you know, accessory or something, it's a car, you, you know, it's really the kind of thing that you've, you've taken the time to care about and, and you want to know. And that's where I think our, you know, master brand is really important to keep, to keep that top of mind and make sure that that stays relevant to them. That's an amazing, simple cue that you just provided, which is the distinction between something you really, really care about and you really love and you like and you want to go get it the way you want it versus go shop in the marketplace somewhere, right? right? Just get it, right? That's a really very clear distinction. I love that. You know, as you're talking about trust and the trust comes from so many different places, have you leveraged some like, celebrity influencer kind of connections and things like that as a way to establish trust or is that not relevant within the category where you operate i think our trust really comes for our customers um the trust and value comes in the history and the heritage and the strength i got the company um and doing the right thing so for us you know i think what we really leverage is um, the values that we have, the position that we have um, around diversity and inclusion, the consistency that we have to sustainability, you know, all of the things that really made people say, I trust that company because um, sure. I care about them. And for financial services, trust really is around stability and strength and performance. Um, and so that's your history and your heritage. Um, we have a lot of different sponsor opportunities that we work with, with different partners in the industry um, and even, you know, just sort of partners, but they're really more for consumers to engage with, for us to find common audiences and preferences and passions as a brand. Um, but we haven't ever really leveraged, you know, I think our, our industry leaders and the market um, is what, and our performance and how we do with there is really what builds people's trust. And, and also the fact that, you know, we've, we've been around for 170 years and we've never not paid out a life insurance policy. We, we, we consider ourselves a company that keeps its promise. Um, and whenever you need something from us, from any kind of a claim or a payout, you know, we're, we pride ourselves on the trust to make sure that they know you'll get it as quickly as possible too. Fantastic. So you are leading us to this whole topic of trust. We understand in your category in financial services, clearly the fundamental pillars of trust are what you described the way you described it, you know, stability, consistency, and all the things that Mass Mutual does. Um, on that topic, this whole idea of consumer privacy, consent, and this whole topic has to have amazing relevance for a trusted brand like Mass Mutual. Where do you stand on that? And what are you thinking about as you see going out? Because obviously, 
amazing sensitivities there and for all the right reasons. Remember, Jennifer, I will remind you of the 22 years ago, whenever, when we were together there at Digitas. Remember those days when the do not call list was actually out? Yes. And it absolutely destroyed the outbound telecommunications market, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It would it, be smart if we didn't learn any lessons. Hopefully we learned some lessons from there that if you're not careful and if you don't have a trusted relationship with the consumer, the channel just will not exist for very long, right? Exactly. So we just have to be extremely cautious and very careful about the way we tread this forward. And for digital advertising to be robust, obviously I don't need to complete the sentence. <laughs> how, how do you see it? And where do you see this evolving for Mass Mutual next year? I, I think we're, we're always gonna be in a bit of a unique situation because we, are, we operate in a heavily regulated industry. We're a mutual company, which means that everybody that is a policy owner is an owner. Um, and so data privacy is always gonna be a top priority for us. Um, we have a data governance and data security teams that have real specific policies and procedures that ensure that we are all um, focused on protection and that includes any type of data. Um, so for us, we really, the evolution is looking really at that frontline security, um, whether it's you know personal data or um, what's the appropriate data that we could be using for a capture perspective. When it, when it breaks into marketing, I think it's really looking at being really careful with the data that we have for prospecting and cross sell. Um, and that's where really the elements of precision marketing and personalization have to be coming in and they have to be relevant. Um, if you consider the fact that we could potentially know some, so much about somebody as an existing customer down to the details of their financial profile um, and every family member that I have, why we would not hold the silver, same responsibility to have the right detail to know what message is appropriate for them. And that's really where it has to be um, really specific. So we, we tend to do a lot of modeling. We work with a lot of different data science opportunities. Um, we just dedicate um, a team of people to really looking at the research to stay on top of our customers' evolving needs, look at the deliverable target audiences that we could, um, and again, really using advanced analytics to mine customer data so we can really understand the right needs. You know, it's sort of that trade-off where you sort of say, well, good thing for you, you have all this information on them. But on the other hand, you know, bad thing for us if we don't get them the right message because we have all this information on them. Um, and I think that the value there is, is um, the trust to give somebody more data about yourselves is really in the value exchange. You know, I, you know, I'll give you everything you need to know about me if you're going to give me something that I think is important and relevant to me. And so that's where we're constantly evolving and making sure that we we have the sort of that burden of, of um, trust and confidence, but also the burden of knowledge to make sure that we're really being um, using analytics and data to make sure that the personalization is appropriate. Excellent. Jennifer, we are in the last five minutes at this point. As you can tell, time flies by really fast here, right? When we are in a conversation like this. Um, Let's talk about one thing now that you have one or two things, your favorite things that you have done and you've learned from that over the last year, two years, what have you, right? That you're proud of and it's something that would be of relevance to marketers across the board, right? Talk about something like that so that when marketers hear about it, they can do something and factor that into what they will do next year. Okay, so just connect the dots here. What are you proud of? What did you What did you felt was like, wow, this is something that we did. We were so proud, so excited. Learn some things, could be good, could be bad, you know, doesn't really matter. It's either way, it's learning, right? Whether it's worked or didn't work, doesn't really matter. I, I would say actually, maybe this is, I'm sort of the eternal optimist, but I would say maybe something good that came out of the past two years of us working under a pandemic. Um, was I was so proud of the fact that we worked in an environment where we were moving at um, just a rapid pace of, of uncertainty. And we gave ourselves the freedom to make really good decisions and follow our heart on them. We relied on each other. I mean, we were shifting messages in market every week. And then when you think about what happened with the pandemic and what consumer sentiment was, you know, like we really learned that they, you can say that the consumers drive it until you live in an environment where you don't have a choice. We're all sitting in our homes and we can't figure out how to move anything. You have to follow what people are saying and feeling and thinking and making sure that you're staying on top of that. 
Um, so with consumer sentiment changing on a daily basis, then moving into a period of time where we were only living through crisis of, around our health and in our communities, but, but crisis at a national level around social issues, we were constantly flying to keep up. And I think um, we were so good at keeping that message straight because you stick with your true north of what you stand for as a brand. And that's what we made decisions on. Um, I think it was a combination of making sure that you always trust your instincts and are willing to, to move quickly because we don't get to decide how quickly our consumers are gonna change their mind on anything that has to do with us or what's happening in their world. And um, no, I'm just, I'm really proud of the fact that even though it was probably one of the most hectic and uncertain and crazy times for us as marketers, we learned so much and my, I think my team and, and all of us and a lot of us in the industry were able to be you know, front, um, front and center of what mattered. And as marketers, we, you know, a lot of us really, a lot of great brands out there just never lost their eye um, or their ability to move quickly and, and trust where their heart was as long as they followed where their consumer was. And you have to know that. You have to know your consumer and then you have to trust your team to, to make the right call. So I think that's probably one of the, the most exciting things that I've been through in the past um, couple of years here. You know, it, that says two things to me, Jennifer. One is the fact that, yes, of course, you are very data-driven as a company, right? And so you're obviously staying on the pulse of the consumer, but there is a second part to that. You have a very robust organization behind you to be able to respond so quickly because, you know, tons of data is out there, of course, you know, to be able to act on it. That's a whole different story, right? right. How do you prepare yourself and how you align yourself and do all of those things? Obviously, a lot of credit to you. We have two minutes. I'm going to ask you one question because it, it, it just has to be asked. There is so much conversation about NFTs and cryptocurrencies and a variety of other things that are emerging and they're becoming really hot topics. And if I didn't ask, somebody's going to say, why didn't we address that question with Jennifer, who is so experienced, right? Um, tell me, is there some relevance of NFTs and cryptocurrencies into your business right now? Or is that something you're just kind of thinking about and might do something? Is, is the next year the year? Yeah, it's a, a little bit of both, I would say, for sure. Crypto is definitely an innovative and shifting opportunity in our industry. So from a product perspective, we, um, we've done some really interesting stuff with it. Um, we, a lot of, we've made some product innovation moves. Um, and because we really do believe that crypto is increasingly becoming a part of the financial landscape. Um, it was just about this time last year that we made an investment of 100 million in Bitcoin for our general investment account. Um, and we're working on a ton of initiatives to better serve all of our clients and our financial professionals to allow them to better offer qualifying clients access to this fund and you know, an alternative and efficient way to invest in Bitcoin. Um, so from a marketing perspective, we'll be building around that messaging, showing the opportunity to support the business and distribution teams. It's a differentiator in the industry, um, I think for sure. Um, we're also looking at the value chain connection for an, N, for an NFT strategy. Um, again, given the challenge that we are, and um, we work in a distribution channel that's B2B to C ultimately, um, but I think that there's huge opportunity for retail and direct to consumer brands. Um, that I follow um, closely that have really done an amazing job experimenting with it. I think, you know, brands like Taco Bell and their Swivel Taco, McDonald's. Sure, of course. I mean, just crazy stuff. And, and I think, you know, one of the, the brilliant examples is even with Campbell's Soup, where there's a, here's a brand that's trying to find a way to use this platform to reinvent their brand, a core brand element, the soup label, um, and, and present something that's modern and, and really um, innovative and I think NTFs work really well um, when you want to appear to this appeal to this different generation of consumers um, and, and really under, you know, understand how to relate and connect with them. Um, so I think for, you know, for some of the other different type of purchasing brands and retail brands, it's just a fascinating space for me. I think, um, you know, as an investment opportunity, of course, we love Bitcoin. We think that crypto is amazing um, and we're doing it in the most responsible way for our distribution channels. But um, NFTs, I think it's just going to be amazing and fun to see where we can take these integrated experiences um, with this type of technology.